Hey, this is Jerry Galloway. I'm the pastor of LHA Church, and this is our podcast. Thank you for joining us today. I hope this encourages your heart, strengthens your faith, and gives you perspective that God is moving in your life. Enjoy the message. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you'll take them out, and we're going to go together today to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. You know, when we approach communion as we have done so today in this place, you know, as believers, we understand that this ordinance of the church is really something that's temporary. There's going to come a time when uh, it is going to end in the way that we celebrate it here on earth. Matthew chapter 26, Jesus was finishing the Last Supper with his disciples, and he told them this. He said, I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In 1 Corinthians 11, the passage we read during communion, it said we, as we do this and we are remembering his death, until he comes. Jesus was speaking prophetically concerning the day when we're going to be gathered together for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Following the rapture of the church, there's going to be a great marriage supper of the Lamb. You know, following uh, weddings here on earth, we know what it is after the ceremony's over and everybody hoops and hollers. We go and we celebrate a, a meal together and we sit around the tables and, and we rejoice over what has happened. There's coming a day when the heavenly bridegroom, Jesus Christ, is going to gather his bride, the church of the Lord Jesus, together with him, and we're going to celebrate the ultimate victory. We're going to celebrate. I kind of, I kind of in my mind's eye, kind of see it as it's going to be a celebration where the topic around the table is we have overcome. We've overcome through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have overcome every trial of the enemy. Yes, there were times it was difficult. Yes, there were times it was hard, but we have overcome. It's going to be an incredible celebration together as we celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know, with that in mind, I want to take a few minutes this morning, and I want to stir up the hope that is in our hearts. I want to take some time to remind us today of what is waiting on us. You know, the life that you and I are living now is, is a good life, but it's not the best experience you're ever going to have. No matter how great this life may seem to be for you at the moment, the best is yet ahead of us in a place called heaven. Can you say amen? amen. My prayer this morning is for those who are going through a season of difficulty, that you'll be able to, with God's help, look past your present trials and see what's ahead. Keep pressing on, for the current trials you're walking through will not last forever, but heaven Heaven will last forever. So I encourage you today to keep holding on. Don't give up. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. You know, there's something that happens inside of us when, you know, I don't know if you're like I am, but I get so busy in the doing of life and got to get this done, got to get that done. Sometimes all I can think about is what's pressing in on my life right now. But, you know, when we begin to talk about heaven and we begin to talk about what's ahead of us, and, and uh, you know, it's been pretty fresh, I'll be honest with you, in my mind here because in the last few weeks we've had uh, several memorial services that we've had together as, as a church body. And in those times we remember and we reflect on heaven and we begin to talk about heaven. And there's something that transpires inside the heart of a believer when you begin to talk about heaven, even though... None of us have been there. There's a fondness that wells up inside of us when we think about what heaven's going to be like. And I, I think the reason for that, the Bible says in the book of Philippians that our citizenship is not on this earth, but as believers, our citizenship is in heaven. Could you say amen? And so we have this desire to be there. Now, our understanding of heaven really is the hope 
of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our understanding of that hope is what equips us and strengthens us as we go through trials in this life to continue to endure and to persevere. Psalm 30 and verse 5 says it well. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy, joy. Somebody say joy. Joy. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. My friend, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the greatest part of your existence is yet ahead of you. Revelation 21, as we look through the Scriptures, there's probably no greater description of heaven and what we can anticipate when we get to heaven than what we find written here in Revelation chapter 21. This morning, I want us to take a few minutes together, and we're going to walk through this passage together. And My prayer today is that your heart will be encouraged. And maybe you'll lift up your eyes a little bit higher off of the things of this earth and begin to think about what is yet ahead of us. Look in Revelation 21 and verse number 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now, if you have your Bible or your electronic device of choice, you may just want to leave that out because we're going to walk through together through this passage in Revelation 21. The first thing that we notice in this passage, the Bible says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. He's making everything new. Now, the word new in that verse really means new in quality, new in character. It's new in comparison to old. How many of y'all know? How many of y'all understand what old is? How many of y'all are getting a greater understanding of what old is? <laughs> Paul and I often we go over to Taylor University and there we'll exercise and we'll walk and you know, you're feeling pretty good about what you're doing until them young kids come out and they run. You know we're walking around the uh, the campus and those kids keep lapping us. And the amazing thing is we're out of breath walking quick and they're running and you can't even hear them breathing. Kind of that comparison of the new and the old. And when we look at that passage, it's the opposite of what you and I are accustomed to in this world. You see, when, when you're outside in the, in the summertime, the springtime, you see the green grass and the trees swaying in the breeze, the birds are singing. But the truth is we are in a season now where we're coming to a realization that we live in a world where there's death and decay. There's nothing on this planet that's held back from the curse of decay. Now, in contrast to that thinking that, you know, when we think about new, we think new because everything gets old eventually. In contrast with that, verse number 5 there in Revelation 21 says this, He who was seated on seated on the throne said, Look, I am making, notice this key word, everything new. I'm making everything new. First of all, he says there's going to be a new heaven. Now, the word heaven, then when it's used in Scripture, it is most generally used in three ways. When when Scripture's talking about heaven, first of all, it's talking about when you go outside and you look up and and you see the beautiful blue sky and you see the white puffy clouds and it's just a beautiful day. Some days you're out and you're like, isn't the sky beautiful today? When scriptures talk about one of the first things that it uses to describe heaven is the things we see immediately. Secondly, it talks about when you go out at nighttime and it's dark and you see the the stars beginning to shine and you see the glory of God in in all this. Paul and I walked into the house the other night and, and we just stopped outside the door and just looked at the sky for a little bit. It was so beautiful, God's handiwork as the stars it seemed like all of them were out and just shining so bright that night. Secondly, that's what we're talking about. The scriptures talk about when it talks about heaven. Thirdly, it talks about the third heaven where God is at. The place of, of God's presence is the third heaven. Now, when John says there's going to be a new heaven, what he's talking about is all three of these things, all three of these realms as we know them are going to be done away with and replaced. Next, he says there's going to be not only a new heaven, but there's going to be a new earth. New earth. So everything you've been working on on this earth, guess what? It's going by the way. 
Everything we put energy and effort to in this life is getting ready to go. The house is going by its wayside. The car is gone. Everything we know is going because the Bible says it's going to be a new earth. If you think the old is good, just wait till you see the brand new. Now, this concept of new is different than our understanding of new because we have an element of bias when it comes to this. Everything we know that is new eventually decays. How many of y'all ever had a new car? How many of y'all know a few years down the road, it's not as shiny as it was when it was on the showroom floor? It don't smell as good. It don't ride as good. Now, you know, when you got it, you rode down the road, it was quiet as can be. Now, when you turn the corner, it creaks and bumps and carries on and chugs. And you're like, Lord, just get me home in this thing. One time, it was brand new. And you were so proud of it. You wanted to show everybody. Now it's wore out. You don't want anybody to see. You're just thinking, Lord, don't let nobody recognize me in this car before I get back. You see, everything we know that is once new will eventually decay. Heaven, heaven is nothing like that. Nothing in heaven ever gets old. Nothing in heaven will ever be affected by the curse of sin. It's going to be brand new. And that, that concept of new for us is something that's totally different. Everything in heaven will never change. Then he goes on in verse number 2 and he says these words, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Now, the new Jerusalem is going to be a new city that God is preparing for us. There's four characteristics we see in this passage regarding that city. As I was in preparation for today, I thought, how, how much it's perfect timing to talk about this. Notice what he says. I saw the holy city. It's a holy city. What does that mean? It's a city that's pure and righteous, one that is set apart by God and for God. And, and I'd like, in, in line of everything that's going on today in, in uh, our nation and really around the world, I want you to imagine for a moment a holy city, a sinless city. Just think about it. Nobody has a wrong motive. Nobody speaks a wrong, ill word. Nobody has an impure motive. None of that. Honestly, I think our world is, is in such a state of wickedness, we don't even realize how wicked it really is. Because it's just become the norm in our culture. But imagine for a moment, all of that is gone. Nobody's going to be calling your phone in heaven and trying to trick you and scam you. Nobody's going to be overcharging your friend. Your neighbors aren't going to be lying to you. Your spouse is not going to be lying to you. Nobody in heaven is going to be sneaking around doing something behind everybody's back. Children will be safe. Wives will be safe. Husbands will be safe. There won't be any more tensions. We're all going to be there together. It's a holy city. Notice that it says, not only is it a holy city, but it's from God. He said, I saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Where? From God. The book of James tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. So it's a holy city from God. He goes on to say, now is it from God, but it's been prepared by God. John 14, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. What an incredible place it's going to be. I don't know. I don't know how long it takes. I know he created the world and all it is. In just a few days, Jesus has been gone for 2,000 years. Imagine how incredible this place is going 
to be heaven. Then John tries to put into words, if you have ever tried to uh, describe something to someone and you had to use pictures and words to try to help them to understand what you were talking about, that's kind of what he's doing in this passage. John puts into words what he's seeing. He says, the holy city was prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. What John is saying is that this place is going to be beautiful, incredible. It's, it's anything but ordinary. I want you to think about heaven this morning. I want you to think about what's ahead of you because it'll help you to keep marching through what you're walking through. We know that our best is not behind us, but our best days are before us. Amen? And the next thing we see is this. The Bible says in heaven... Man, this is an incredible part. God is near. Look at verse 3. It says, And I heard in a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Look at verse 7. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. I will be their God and they will be my children. You know, the thought of God dwelling is a picture. It's a picture of how God has dwelt with man throughout human history. In the Old Testament with the children of Israel, we find that God was found to be on the mountaintop called Sinai, and it was there that Moses went to meet with God. Later, he is said to have dwelt in the tabernacle throughout the wilderness wandering. Then he dwelt in the temple behind the great veil in the place called the Holy of Holies. The Bible tells us it was a place of God's strong presence so much that man couldn't go behind the veil, couldn't go behind the curtain, otherwise he'd be struck dead. In the Bible, God is pictured as being on the throne in heaven while humanity, while you and I are here on this earth. It's always been a picture of God at a distance from us. We know, though, that in the beginning, in God's original plan, we find when you go back to the book of Genesis that man is in the garden, and and man heard the sound of God walking in the garden. God intended in the beginning to be in close proximity and relationship with his people. What we find with heaven is God is once again, thank you, Lord, he is restoring that relationship with man. Our dwelling will be with God and he will live with us. Psalm 116 and 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. I always stumbled over that scripture. I'm just being honest with you because I have conducted numerous funerals over the years and i've never come to one funeral and described it as the word precious there are tears there's grief there's difficulty because we we know there's a period and a time of separation and i always thought the scripture says precious in the sight of the lord is the death of his saints you know I think the revelation there is this. When you and I see death, we see it as an end. But God sees it as the beginning. God is there at that moment. God begins to put things back in proper perspective. and God puts it back in order. What you and I see as finality, God sees as the beginning of all eternity. Now we'll be with God forever. 
We're never going to be separated. God's heart has broke. God's heart has been grieved through the process of sin. But when God's precious saints, the soul leaves this body, things are put back in proper perspective. Oh, my friend, God's heart, no wonder it's as precious in the sight of the Lord as the death of his saints. Imagine for a moment, we're always talking about longing to be in the presence of God. Imagine for a moment, 24-7. Actually, you know, I say 24-7, but time as we know it will be no more. Whoo! Right in His presence. In His presence, there is nothing that breeds evil actions. Nothing in his presence that breeds uh, anything that is difficult. No sorrows. Everything is right. Everything is perfect. Everything is pure. Imagine for a moment living in the presence and the love of God. There is nothing, nothing, nothing impure about that moment. It's all only goodness. There's no evil. There's no suffering. We have been so... Uh, accustomed to sorrow, we can't imagine the load. I think we just walk under every day that we live because we live on a cursed planet. We live under the curse of sin in the body. I can't imagine the moment when all of that is lifted off. Whew. Notice verse 7, it says this, those who are victorious will inherit all this. Now, we all understand what inheritance is, but the good news is, you know, in my family, I get the inheritance. You don't get it because you're not a part of my family. Honey, we get there. We're all a part of the family. <laughs> we're all, Tom, you and I are both going to get it, buddy. We're equal heirs. We're all. The Bible says those who are victorious. Why do we encourage you? Keep pressing on. Keep your heart right with Jesus. It's because those who are victorious will inherit all this that the Scripture describes. Heaven is going to be what it is because of the nearness of God. We will be enveloped by everything that makes God who He is. The third thing you'll find is heaven. This is so so wonderful. Heaven will be absent from the curse of sin. Verse number four, he will wipe every tear. You, you've got to understand what it's saying, every tear, every tear. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Notice that it says that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. God will do it. Not an angel, not another. Uh, Paul and Peter, they're not coming with the Kleenex box. God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. It has been said that tears are symbolic of the pain of life on this earth. The things which have broke our hearts, the things which have shattered our dreams, things that have disappointed us, things that have disillusioned us, things that we have silently anguished about, everything that has caused fear and doubt and disbelief and anxiety and worry and depression and disillusion will all be gone. The curse of sin has caused so much heartache. Everything that has caused tears will be gone. God is very aware. Listen, you may say, I silently cry and nobody knows. God is very aware when his children cry. Psalm 56 and 8 says that God collects our tears and they're kept in his bottle. You say, how does he do that? I don't know. You say, I don't believe that. Well, you have to argue with him. Because his word says he collects our tears and stores them in his bottle. There's coming a time when God is going to wipe away the very last tear from our eyes and it will bring an end to the things that have caused tears and sorrow. Under the curse of death, when 
heaven is absent, the curse of death, we find there will be no more death. Think about that for a minute. No more funerals. No more funeral homes. No more caskets. No more viewings. No more separation. No more parting. No more having to stand by the grave of a loved one and say goodbye. If there's no more death, then there are no more the things that cause death. There'll be no more sickness, no disease, no cancer, no more MRIs you have to have, no more doctor's appointments, no more prescriptions, no more tests. It will all be over. There won't be any more aging. No more of knowing our time is getting shorter. No more funeral plans, no more funeral preparations, no more pains, no more aches. Can you say amen to that one? No more aging of the body. We'll all have a new body. We get to heaven and you're going to have hair envy of me. <laughs> Brand new body. Nothing to wear out. Think about this. It's always new. Isn't that, I'm just beyond, isn't that a hard concept? Because we only know things being new and getting older. New body will always be in a state of newness. You will never get out of a chair to heaven and go, oh. You'll never do anything in heaven, and the next day you go, Oh, my Lord, I can't believe how sore I am. Always new. Will not age. It will not wear out. He says, verse 5, I am making everything new. See, this part of the curse that we know on this earth causes Everything to age and to die and to wear out, my friend, in heaven, it will all be over. He goes under on to say under the curse of sin, there'll be no more mourning or crying or sorrow. Think about that for a moment, if you will. Our world today, there are people because of a shooting that took place yesterday. There are people that are mourning in our nation today. This time last week, they had no idea. Friday, they had no idea that their life on this earth would be changed forever. The Bible says heaven is a place there will be no more morning. Think about it. The things of life that have caused you sorrow. Nothing there. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing there will ever be able to cause you sorrow again. Nothing to be discouraged about. Nothing to be disappointed about. Nothing to be burdened by. There will be no depression in heaven. Nothing to worry yourself about. There will be no anxiety. No, have you all ever had a frustrating day? I mean, you could describe, people say, what's wrong with you? I don't know, I'm just frustrated. Well, what happened? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just frustrated. And they say, well, what do you mean frustrated? I'm getting frustrated now It's you. We understand frustrations. Nothing there to cause frustration. All the things in life that have caused you and I emotional discomfort in this life will all be gone. No one in heaven will be worrying over finances. No one in heaven will be worrying over their jobs and their bosses and things going on. Nobody in heaven will be worrying over the kids. Nobody in heaven will be worrying over their marriage. Nobody in heaven will be worrying about anything. You'll notice the scripture goes on and says, no more pain. Now, usually when we think about pain, I don't know if, if you're like I am, but when I think about pain, I think about something that you take Advil for. I think about pain being joints that are stiff or joints that don't move at all 
or muscles that are sore, or nerves that are uh, upset in my body. We understand what pain is like, but I tell you, that's just a small segment of the pain that will be gone in heaven. There won't be any pain physically, but there will also be no pain relationally. There will be no pain spiritually. No pain from broken relationships. No pain from hurts or offenses. No more. Nobody in heaven will ever say, I feel lonely today. No one in heaven will say, I don't think anybody cares about me. No, no more feeling dejected and left alone. No joints will wear out. No hearts to clog up. No muscles to get sore. No toothaches, headaches, backaches, leg aches. Any kind of ache. Can you imagine heaven? Listen, I'm not talking today about a fairy tale. I'm not telling you today about something that, oh, it's a great idea and we ride off in the sun. I'm telling you this is a reality for the believers. The Bible says to the one who overcomes will inherit all these things. All the things that have caused spiritual pain will all be gone. Romans 6 says the wages of sin is death. No more hurt from sin and it's waste. How many times have people been disappointed by somebody else's sin? How many churches have been disappointed over a pastor who's gone the wrong direction? How many husbands or wives have been disappointed over a spouse that's went another way? How many times a parent disappointed over the waywardness of a child? All the things that have caused hurt will all be gone. Heaven is going to be incredible. Incredible. Look at verse number 8. We find that the Bible says all these things to describe this place. But we can't overlook this part we find in verse number 8. It says, but the cowardly, look at these next two words, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, for this is the second death. This knowledge is possibly, for believers, one of the saddest truths that we have to live with. It's this truth that not everyone is going to heaven. I'll tell you today, as much as we rejoice over what heaven's going to be like while we're on this earth, this is a sad truth. Everyone isn't going to heaven Statistically speaking, there are probably individuals in this room that aren't going to heaven. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction and many are on it, but narrow is the way that leads to heaven and only a few find it. There will be those who will not go there. They will not experience the things that you and I have talked about today. As much as my heart rejoices, I have to tell you, on this side, my heart breaks. You know, we've had, uh, in the last three weeks, we've had three funeral services that we have walked through as a church body here at this place. And, you know, in preparation for those times, I have to tell you, there. There's something different when you conduct a funeral service for somebody who's a believer. I, there's hope there. Um, I often say at the closing of a funeral service, we're not here to say goodbye. We're here to say we'll see you later. 
There's a hope that we have because in that funeral service, we can talk about the hope that they had in Christ. We can talk about, we know where they're at today, and we know that they're, you know, the Bible says, be absent from this body. Paul said, rather be absent from this body and be present with the Lord. There's incredible hope in that. But I have to tell you, over the years, I have conducted funerals where the individual who had passed away did not have that hope. I want to tell you, in these funeral services we've had, there have been tears that have been shed. I, I will, I'm not going to tell you that there haven't. People's hearts have been broken. Because we, we grieve for us. We don't grieve for them, but we grieve for us. There's a loss for us. But at the same time, we can have tears, but they can also be tears of joy. Because we know this is not all there is to it. But I have stood by caskets with families, and the individual who had passed away did not know Jesus Christ and did not have the hope of heaven. Many of them never lived that way, didn't want to, and there's something different about that service. It's a heavier service. It's more of a heart-wrenching service. I have, I have stood... Uh, one of my responsibilities is once I finish the funeral service, I come and I stand at the head of the casket and I am there uh, until all the family has come by and friends have come by and the family has left the room. I remain there at the head of the casket. Over the years, I can't tell you the times I've seen people, they didn't have words, they just stood there and, and wept. When you don't know Jesus Christ, when you're right ready for heaven, friends, it changes everything about eternity. I think one of the things that's very important we understand about verse 8 is because we say, you know what? Uh, we see ourselves as good, moral, upright individuals. You know, you and I kind of live in the Bible belt, and it's no big deal in our, our culture here in Indiana to talk about our faith in Christ and, and all of those things. We can do so freely, and we can share all those things, but you and I are part of a world today where that's not always the case. We're blessed to be here, but there's... There's coming a time when things are going to change. Heaven is a reality. I'm not preaching this direction today, but hell is also a reality. Listen to what the scriptures have to say. 1 John 5 and 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. John 3 and 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. You know, in this culture we live in, we say, you know, we see, we see people who commit horrific crimes just like yesterday with what happened with that shooting yesterday. We see these horrific things that happen, and we say, my Lord, I never would be that kind of person. And we read verse 8, and we, we say, I, I'm not the sexually immoral. I'm not the uh, liar. I'm not, I'm not all these things. But the Bible even says the unbelieving. The unbelieving. All liars. All liars. You know, there's no such thing as a little white lie. All liars. Jesus said in John 14 and 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4 and 12 says that this way salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. So let me wrap this up for us. 
Heaven is incredible. We know that. We've talked about it. We've seen it. We've heard the scriptures. We've heard the other side that not everyone is going there. So the question, the only question I can ask you today is do you know today that you're ready for heaven? Do you know that you're ready for heaven? You may say, well, listen to me. I hope you do not tire me using these illustrations. I, I have had people in funeral services that have said, please tell me my loved one isn't going to hell. I can't, I, I, I can't say that. I can't. It's not my call. I've heard people say, preacher, they were a good person. You hear that all the time. I'm telling you, those are the things they'll say, but they did all these good things. Bible says there's only one way to heaven. One way. There's not one way and sub points. One way to heaven. That's through Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter that you and I are a good person. It doesn't matter that we may do great things for the people. It doesn't matter that we're a great neighbor, a great employee, a great spouse, a great mother or father or brother or sister. None. Those things are not in the list. There's only one way. No one comes to the Father, Jesus said, except through him. No one. No one. Doesn't matter if you're the preacher or the person sitting on the back rows. Everyone in between. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. I'm thankful you're a good person. I'm thankful you've done many good things. Some of you, you know, I feel so blessed to be here. We have such an incredible group of people who are just so kind. I'm thankful for that. But my friend, that will not get either one of us there. So I want to ask you, if the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus, I want to ask you, do you have a relationship with Jesus? And you say, Pastor, what does that mean? Here's what it means. Have you asked Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior, to forgive you of your sin, and to make you his very own? Have you done that? Have you done that? And you know what? There are people that come across uh, many times that say, you know, Pastor, I did that as a kid, but I don't feel like, you know, man, I, I, I've been living a different life, Pastor, since then. I don't feel like things are right between me and him. Listen, the Bible says if we confess our sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if things aren't right, with him today, my friend, they can be. It's not a hard thing. You don't have to do an amount of works to earn it. We all come to him the same way. We bring our broken pieces. We bring our messes. We bring our bad choices. And we all come to him the same way. And we say, Lord, this is all I have to offer. Will you take me? The good news is the Bible says he will not turn you away. Whew. His forgiveness is great. Would you bow your heads this morning? My heavenly Father, I look to you today. I look to you in this moment because, Father, there's nothing else I can do. I have presented the gospel today. Father, I ask you now, Lord, we know that it's the Holy Spirit that draws us to be saved. Lord, I pray for men and women and young people in this room this morning that maybe they're not in right relationship with you. Maybe they've never, maybe they've never known you as your as Savior and Lord. Maybe they've never come into that relationship with you. Maybe there are those who maybe many years ago they did. But you say, you know what, Pastor, I'm away from him today. Friend, I don't care how long you've been in this church, and I don't care what other people may think about you. If you say in your heart today, Pastor, I'm not right with the Lord today. I'm not right with the Lord today. I'm not right with the Lord today. I want to tell you, friend, you can be. Don't leave here today. Don't leave here today without making your life right, your life right with him. Why? 
The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Why is that the truth? Because, friend, I cannot promise you that I'll be here or you'll be here next Sunday. I can't promise you that you and I will be here tomorrow night because life is short. So, friends, if we're going to make a decision for Jesus, today's the day to do it. Father, I just ask you right now, speak to every heart. Speak to every life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, would you keep your heads bowed? I'd ask for the next few moments, if you'll just stay here with me and no going in or out. Friend, do you know Jesus today? I've already described to you. I don't need to describe. If you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that my life is right with him. I'm not sure that I'm ready for heaven. And you say, please remember me in prayer this morning. Would you just lift your hand right where you're at? Yes. 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 Friend, you can put your hand down after you've raised it. Any others, you would join these that have raised their hand and say, please remember me in prayer today. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I'm ready. I'm not sure that I'm ready. Yes. How many others? Please remember me in prayer. I'm not sure that I'm ready. Would you just lift your hand? Please remember me in your prayer this morning. Okay. Listen, friend, I can't do this for you. He's the only one that can forgive you. He's the only one that can wash away your sin. With your heads bowed, right where you're at right now in this moment. Listen, he's here today. He's here and ready to forgive and ready to cleanse. I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me today. Friend, I just want to encourage you, just pray this prayer from your heart. Because I believe he's right here today to forgive. All across this room, if you lifted your hand, pray this prayer with us. If you didn't raise your hand, pray this prayer with us all together. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you today to forgive me of all my sin. I ask you today to cleanse my life. Lord, I want to be right with you. Lord Jesus, I ask you today, make me ready for heaven. I can't do this on my own. I need you. So I ask you in this moment to be the Lord of my life. Change me and make me like you. I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, it's not hard to receive forgiveness. We just have to ask. We just have to ask. Friend, I believe if you prayed that prayer from your heart today, Your sins are forgiven. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed all of our sin from us. He chooses not to remember them anymore. You see, today you may have walked in here and you didn't have the hope of heaven, but you can leave here today knowing no matter what happens, I'm ready. I'm ready to meet him. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to ask you this morning to um, to join me in something in, in, in our close. Today, if you have a loved one, uh, a friend, a coworker, neighbor, doesn't matter who it is, you just have somebody that's connected to your life 
that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior yet, we're going to have prayer for our loved ones today. And so today, if you have know somebody who doesn't know Jesus and you want them to find Jesus, what I'd like to ask you to do is would you step out from where you're at and come and stand across the front and together we're going to bring our families before the Lord. We're going to pray for our loved ones, our neighbors, our co-workers, sons and daughters, spouses, uh, whoever it might be in your life. You just say, I, I have someone. Just move in as closely as you can, if you will. I want to give as much opportunity for as many to join us. Friend, I don't know when Jesus is coming, but I know he's coming soon. There's not a day, not a moment, not a time that's not important for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Today as you're standing here, you have the name or the names of people. You know them by heart. Many of them you've been praying for many, many years and months. I would tell you that uh, I have an uncle today that is in heaven and at one time my uncle was not prepared for heaven and I'll never forget you know my, my entire life growing up my uncle didn't know Jesus and I'm telling you when, when my uncle found Christ I, I'm not exact I saw a different man when I walked into his room his, count, his face was totally changed I want to tell you something my aunt prayed for him for 40 years. Now, I don't know about you, but 40 years sometimes make you feel like giving up. Two years, five years sometimes make you feel like, man, I prayed and prayed and God, you're not answering. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. If you're not praying for them, who is? Who is? So you have those names. I want to pray over us. And right where you're at, I want to encourage you to pray for them. Let, let me give you some direction how you, how you might choose to pray. If your family is like my family, sometimes they don't want to hear it. They say, okay, you've talked to me about that enough. Don't want to hear it. Okay. I may not be able to talk to you about it, but I can pray, Lord, send somebody else to cross their path. God is bigger than me. God... I pray you'll move a brand new believer into their work department. Somebody they got to work with eight hours a day. <laughs> Somebody they may listen to when they won't listen to me. The Bible, Jesus said, the harvest is so incredible. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he'll send laborers into the field. God, you know where my family member's at. Send laborers into the field. I pray you'll surround my loved one, surround my family members with those who know you. Let's pray together today. And as we do, just right where you're at, in your own way, just bring those people before the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus. God, we stand here today because we understand heaven is real and eternity is a real part of our existence. So, Father, today in the name of Jesus, we just pray. We bring our loved ones before you, Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bring our loved ones, Father, and place them in your hands. And, Father, in the name of Jesus, today, Father, I pray that you'll send somebody to cross their path. I pray you'll send somebody new into the workplace. I pray, Father, a friend, a coworker will be there. Somebody, God, we may not always be able to share with them. But, God, you can work things together. And, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus as they lay their head on the pillow at night to go to rest. God, I pray you'll be there in the room. You're the one that draws them to be saved. So, Lord, we pray today, send laborers into the fields that no one will be left. Send laborers into the field that our family members will come to know you. God, we lift them up before you. God, we lift them up before you. God, we bring them before you. 
Lord, we know your desires, they would be saved. That's our desire. So, Lord, send laborers in the fields. Send more laborers in the fields. God, we lift them up today before you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, friends, often Paul and I were talking this morning early on our way into the church, and often we get so busy with life that we forget. We don't think much about heaven. I want to encourage you. Begin to think about heaven. Begin to think about heaven in light of your loved ones. Never give up praying. Never give up believing. He is the God of all hope. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Heaven is going to be incredible. You will not want to miss all the things that God's prepared. May our Heavenly Father today who loves you, may He pour out His rich blessing of His love in your life. May you experience the incredible depth of His undying love for you. When you walk the path of life this week, may you be reminded of how much He loves you and cares for you. May His blessing rest upon you. May His goodness and His mercy follow you all the days of your life. May you know that His mercies are fresh and new every morning. May His goodness and His tender love always be over your life. May the Lord bless you today. May He keep you and always cause His face to shine upon you. God bless you all. We love you today. Have a great day. May the joy of the Lord always be your strength. God bless you.